how do we become better business leaders? How do we ensure cognitive biases don't play in our lives, our careers, or businesses? Hello, everyone. Welcome to my show, Curry Up Startup Podcast, a podcast to spotlight Asian entrepreneurs and interesting people that I meet in my life. Today, I have with me a very special guest, a cognitive neuroscientist and behavioral economist, Dr. Gleb Sipursky. Dr. Gleb, it's amazing to have you on our Curry Up Startup podcast and welcome to my show. Thank you so much, Priyanka. It's a pleasure. I really appreciate you inviting me. As we all know, this podcast is focused on promoting Asian entrepreneurs and innovators. But when I have interesting people that I meet in my life who have amazing research work that will be in the best interest of our Asian community, I bring them on my show. And that's how Dr. Gleb is now part of our show. Dr. Gleb is a person who has very amazing research work under his belt. And he has his latest book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, which just got recently published. I'm thrilled to have you on my show, Dr. Gleb. This gives us a chance to understand the person behind the book, your journey as an author, speaker, writer, as well as your book and how we can all learn on how to become better business leaders. Thank you very much. I look forward to sharing my journey and giving away practical and pragmatic ideas that your listeners can use immediately when they get back to their work. So Dr. Gleb, to begin with, I'm very curious to know who you are as a person. How do you see yourself having had a remarkable career? My passion, what I am as a person, is utilitarian. So that's kind of my value set. I want to do the most good for the most number. And I got into this career because that drove me to focus on decision making. And that actually originated from my childhood, because when I was a kid, I saw my parents making some really bad decisions, unfortunately. They fought over a lot of things that they were not really worth fighting about, and they had a lot of conflicts. And already as a kid, I saw that their conflicts were not worthwhile, and they made some bad decisions. They were both very spontaneous, emotional, gut-oriented people. They went with their gut. And my dad, he was a real estate agent. And he had a variable income because he worked in commissions. And there was this one time when he made quite a lot of money and he hid it from my mom. He bought an apartment elsewhere, rented it out for a while. In a couple of years, when she discovered it, she th- there was a major, big, huge blowout fight, a lot of conflict, very much, a great deal of stress for both of them. They ended up separating for a while. And then they got back together again, but she could never really trust him again. And that really shaped me as a kid, that separation living through it, living through the conflicts, I saw that my dad made such a bad decision. And that's kind of what really drove me into understanding why do people make bad decisions and why and how can we make better ones? And so that's kind of what what impelled me into my career. And there were other factors. I can talk about that later. And and so I began to do training, consulting, co- studying this topic. After I studied it enough, I did training, consulting, coaching, which I've been doing for over two decades. And also I went into not simply studying this topic, but becoming a researcher in academia, going into cognitive neuroscience and behavioral economics. So I spent over 15 years in academia, including five, seven years as a professor at Ohio State researching these topics. So that's kind of where my background comes from that led me here, where my passion, again, is to help people avoid suffering. And by helping people make the best decisions, I think that's the best, most important thing I can do to avoid suffering, helping leaders especially make the best decisions because they can help their followers, people who are they lead, avoid suffering. That's very true, Dr. Gleb. It's very interesting how our childhood memories really shape what we want to do with our life. And for you, it was the memories around your parents and how they could be better decision makers. Glad you're helping the society as a whole with your experience and insights. Now, I know you have a PhD in behavioral science from University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Talk to us about uh, your PhD experience and how that shaped you as a person. My PhD experience was really interesting because during that time, So like I said, I was very interested in decision-making. I already studied it somewhat before going to my PhD, which I did. I started doing training, consulting, coaching already before I got my, I decided to go for formal education, the PhD level, college education and studied these topics by myself. Now, once I got into the PhD, I realized how much I didn't know. (laughs) There was this really interesting episode where uh, just very illustrative. My professor uh, gave me kind of a, my mentor, he said, hey, if you have a choice, I'll give you a choice. Um, 
you take either $45 or you flip a coin for a chance to win $100. What would you choose? And I chose $45. That felt safe to me. I wanted the $45 and I didn't you know, want to risk it. And he told me that the vast majority of people, large majority of people make the same choice that I do. However, the result for them is losing out. They actually lose by making that choice because a flip of a coin is 50% and 50% of 100 is, of course, $50 on average. So if I kept making that choice every time, I would lose a great deal of money. So I'd imagine 100 flips, you know, that's going to be a $5 difference and that's $500. Imagine 10,000 flips, that's going to be a $500 difference and so on. And, you know, imagine a million flips and that's going to be, of course, a $5 million difference. And I said, hey, professor, but you told me, I didn't think of it as a repeating scenario. If you told me it was a repeating scenario, I would change my mind. I would maybe, I, maybe I would choose the fifty percent. And he said that the problem—that's one of the biggest problems with going with our gut, with our intuitions. We feel every choice between us, in front of us, is a one-time choice. Whereas in reality, the one-time choice, the flip of a coin, represents the whole range of choices we make over our whole lives. And we make bad choices because we think of each individual choice as a one-time choice in front of us. Whereas what we really should do is think of it as a representative of a long series of choices. And how would we make these choices given that they're representative of a whole series of choices? Because in reality, our life is just made up of a million coin flips. And so what kind of a choices do we want to make? The safest choice or the ones that make the most benefit that give us the most benefit in the long run, even though they may feel more risky in the moment. So it was just right. one interesting mm-hmm. scenario that really showed me how little I knew and how li- much my intuitions led me astray. That's a very interesting analogy, Dr. Gleb. Uh, most of our times we try to be within our comfort zone, right? Our safety net, there's an outcome that you're very sure about, but sometimes you have to take those risky choices. Tell us about the book, Never Go With Your Gut. For me personally, my belief so far has been your gut instincts are always right. Uh, you know, that's the way most of us tune our brain. And sometimes they work in our best interest. So you kind of feel that, hey, this seems to be working well. But now your approach seems to be slightly different. So tell us more about why we should never go with our gut. <laughs> when I was younger and I didn't study decision making formally, I also thought that you know, going with your gut is the natural choice, the one that feels right, the one that feels comfortable. However, once I got to actually studying these topics, even before graduate school, I learned that our gut is going to lead us in the wrong direction many times, just like it led my dad into the wrong direction when he made his choice to hide the money from my mom, or when my gut led me to choose the $45 instead of the coin flip for $100. Our gut reactions, our intuitions, The big problem with them is that when we feel something is right, we believe it is right. And there is a big difference between feeling and what is the reality outside of us. Many times we feel certain ways about the situation. We feel depressed people feel sad when there is nothing to be sad about. Anxious people feel a threat when there's nothing to be threatened about. And those are just two extremes that we're more familiar with. We can recognize that depression and anxiety are problematic feelings. They don't necessarily represent anything about the external world. Well, our gut reactions are a broader pattern of that same deceptive feelings where a feeling of comfort is often exactly the wrong thing to do. We might feel very comfortable and want, I mean, that feeling of want, take that third chocolate chip cookie, but that may often not be the right thing for our health. And that's, again, gut intuition. That's because our gut intuitions, they don't actually, they aren't actually adapted for the modern environment, our very complex, multinational, global environment. They're not adapted for it. Our gut intuitions, our gut reactions are adapted for the savanna environment. When we were hunters and foragers living in small tribes of 15 people each to 150 people maximum. So we are very tribal. That's a very important and primal aspect of our tribal response where we like people who are like us, who share our background, who share our cultural aspects, who share what our beliefs and where we don't like people who don't. And that's a very big problem in our 
multinational global environment where we have to make decisions and work with people who don't look like us, who don't who share a cultural background if we actually want to succeed, if we want to maximize our success. So tribalism is one big problem. The other big po- problem is the fight or flight response. The fight or flight response was very important for our ancestors to survive. That was critical. They had to jump at a hundred shadows in order to get away from that one saber-toothed tiger. And that was really important. We are the descendants of those people who survived because they had that very strong fight or flight response. However, we have many less saber-toothed tigers in our world right now, as you can imagine. But we still have that tendency when we are faced with a decision, with a conflict, with a problem, with a threat, we tend to jump way too fast, decide way too fast. And very often when we jump, we jump in the wrong direction. And that the big problem here is that entrepreneurs are praised for making fast decisions. And that's very harmful. That's very dangerous. Just like they're praised for going with their gut. That's very harmful. That's very dangerous because often these fast decisions are going to be the wrong decisions. And they set the pattern for a bad series of situations that ruin enterprises through in small businesses. I mean, if you look at small business statistics, you'll see that over the last 50 years, the when you open up a small business, 50% of the time, you're going to fail within five years. And of, of 66% of all small businesses that open up fail within the first decade. So that's really terrible. And that shows you that entrepreneurs make really bad decisions when they just go intuitively with their gut. So that's what some of the stuff, that's the, that's why we should never go with our gut. We should always check with our head before going with our gut. And the book talks about a lot of specifics, a lot of details and specific techniques that would help you make the right decisions. But that's kind of the broad 30,000 foot picture of what the book's about. So if you look at great leaders in our history, great business leaders, uh, you know, be it at companies like GE, they have survived through trials and tribulations of, you know, being the company they are today. And the autobiographies of these business leaders are always about, you know, going with your gut instincts. And it served them well, right? So how do you think this narrative uh, really reflects on these kinds of business leaders who've done it very well with their gut instincts over all these years? I think that's a really interesting question, and especially since you brought up GE, because GE it may well be on the way to bankruptcy. <laughs> if you look at the <laughs> GE in the headlines right now, their financial division is dra- is draining money so much, and their retirement division they seem to have understated a lot of the deb- debts and obligations that they owe. They might well need to go into bankruptcy, unfortunately. So that's kind of a really classical example where. Not a classical example, but a recent example. You know, classically, we think of GE as this great, wonderful enterprise. But within the last two years, GE has been on the rocks. It's really been of down. And now we see that there's a lot of problems in GE that we didn't see before. So this is an example of where an enterprise, a business that we think of as great and wonderful, may be something that's really not wonderful and not nearly as great as we think it is. The same thing happened with Toys R Us. You know, 10 years ago, it was a great business. Now it's bankrupt. So many other examples like this. I mean, look at what happened to Boeing. You know, two years ago, who could imagine, even a year ago, a little over a year ago before the first airplane crash of the 737 MAX, who could imagine that Boeing would have lost $26 billion from its market cap at the present moment. So that's those are all examples where leaders who we praise yesterday are today the villains. <laughs> and there are so many leaders who are in this situation. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg was praised just three, four years ago, and now he's seen as a villain by many people for allowing the Russia to interfere in the elections. So we have a lot of problems where leaders who have this sort of mythology. The leaders like to present themselves as being these sort of magical decision makers that, you know, they have the gut intuitions, they're the wonderful ones, and they're the great ones because their gut makes the right choices. However, these leaders who are go with their gut are often going to make very serious and bad mistakes. There are pros and cons when you're doing a gut-based, you know, an intuition-based decision making and sometimes you know it's hard to predict you know how things could shape up and there could be a lot of other environmental factors that could derail 
the context behind your decision making process so tell me this dr gleb are you proposing a more data driven approach in this decision making process then what i'm proposing is not simply data driven data driven is of course we need data to use our decisions what i'm proposing is a civilized approach to decision making so if we think about gut reactions it's the same making decisions with our gut it's the same way as let's say of eating with our hands or not brushing our teeth you know we the natural thing to do is not brush our teeth. It's to go around with bad breath all day or to not eat with our forks and knives. Those are, those are the natural things. That's the intuitive way that we would go about things. We have learned in certain areas or you know, taking eating as much as possible, eating as much sugar as possible. That's natural intuitive way of doing things. That was what our hunters and foragers ancestors needed to do in order to survive. We've learned that today that's a bad idea, that that's one of the big reasons for the obesity epidemic when people go with their gut on how to eat. And so what I'm proposing is to change our mental habits, our intuitions, our gut reactions from those primitive savage ones to more civilized ones, where we address the kind of dangerous judgment errors that come from that fight or flight response, where we take control of the fight or flight response and we don't just give in to the fight or flight response, where we actually step back and say, hey, what's the actual right decision here? Let me slow down. Let me use a more effective process. So same thing for tribalism. If we don't Necessary. It's not helpful for us to be tribal in our decision making, despite our intuition to do so, to simply work with people who look like us, think like us, and so on. We need to distance ourselves from these sorts of problematic instincts. And what I'm proposing to do is to retrain mm -hmm. our intuition, to make more civilized, more effective choices that actually benefit our bottom line. Can you give us one practical way of reframing our intuition? Taking a moment to pause in your decision-making process feels like a luxury for most of us. So what advice would you have to retrain our brain to think in a certain way? It feels like luxury, but the and the problem is that entrepreneurs, business leaders go around fighting fires all the time. But the fires that they are fighting are actually often the result of their bad decisions. And that's the huge problem that people don't realize, that they don't even realize that they have the fires that come about are a result of them not predicting a problem in advance or making a bad decision. There's So, so I, I was working with a lot of, with a, one entrepreneur who hired his friend because he liked his friend. And uh, from a big corporate company to be the IT manager for his company. This friend couldn't deal with the startup environment, with the startup and the enterprise, he couldn't deal with the chaos that was necessary for a startup. And so the friend didn't really succeed. And the person who hired him, the CEO, had a lot of trouble having difficult conversations with the friend because the friend was a friend. <laughs> so that was an example of where he didn't really think about the problems that would come from hiring somebody he liked and he had to deal with a lot of stress and strain as a result wasted a lot of time and money so that's kind of an example of where the consequences of these gut decisions come to what you can do instead is take a little bit of time just a tiny bit of time a few minutes to pause and think about the decision and ask five key questions to avoid decision disasters. Now, I'm going to go for the five questions, but before going for the questions, I'll give you another example that to illustrate that it doesn't really take more time than you think. The, there was a study done in the UK on firefighters, so firefighting leaders who were literally in the heat of the moment addressing the fire. And what they found was that 80% of mistakes in firefighting come from human error. So they developed a series of questions, three questions that firefighters, leaders asked themselves before they made decisions about how to fight the fire. And those three questions were found to be greatly decreased the amount of errors in firefighting. And the, once they learned these questions, a couple of months 
after they learned these questions, these firefighting leaders were actually making decisions quite fast. When you compare them to firefighting leaders who weren't trained on the questions, the speed of decision making was about the same, but the quality of decision making was much better for people who were trained on these questions. So it's not actually, it doesn't yeah. actually take more time once you change your habits from the natural state to the, the civilized state, just like it doesn't take more time to eat with your fork and knife than it would to eat with your hands. We're excited for the five questions so, now. First question. What important information did I not yet fully consider? Again, what important information did I not yet fully think about? We tend to choose information, look for information that confirms our beliefs, just like the person who was became my coaching client was looking at the friend and saying, hey, he's a friend, that means that he's going to be a good hire. We he did not look at information that did not confirm his beliefs, such as this friend's inability to cope with a startup environment. And that is a really important thing that you want to think about. What information would disconfirm your preferred choice? Look for information that goes against your intuitions. And if you can't find it, that's great. Then it means your choice is much more likely to be correct. And if you can't find it, then maybe you want to rethink your choice or revise it a little bit. First one. Second. What dangerous judgment errors, cognitive biases, did I not yet address? On my book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, goes for the 30 most dangerous judgment errors that business leaders, entrepreneurs tend to make and how we can address them. Next, what would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? So think about the person who would be a trusted and objective advisor to you. Maybe Priyanka would be a trusted and objective advisor to you. Somebody else, who would that person be? What would they suggest you do? You can call this person, or if you're a young person, you can text this person. Or you can, of course, just imagine this. We get about 50% of the benefit when we imagine what this person would do because we take ourselves out of ourselves and we look at the situation from the outsides. So that's free. Four, how have I addressed all the ways this could fail? Again, how have you addressed all the problems that might occur? You can solve a lot of problems in advance. So for example, let's say you have a situation where you have several key leaders in your enterprise and you're growing your enterprise. Have you, do you have backups for all of these key leaders? Can you train somebody to be a backup for each of these people? That way, if somebody gets hit by a bus, you can immediately replace this person. And that's much more effective than just hoping nothing will happen. So that's something that you can prevent in advance. Another thing that you could do is come up with disaster recovery plan. So if a problem does occur, how can you, if you have a plan to address it immediately, you're much better off than trying to come up with a plan in the moment. Finally, fifth question, what new information would cause me to revisit this decision? Again, what would cause you to change your mind about this decision? It's very important to decide this in advance, because if you don't, you're going to be in the heat of the moment implementing the decision. It's going to be really hard to deal with information that is negative, that indicates that you might need to change this decision because we're very very committed to the decision, especially if it's a group decision. So instead, if you decide in advance that, hey, let's say you're launching this product and if it doesn't hit 450,000 in sales within the first six months, then you're going to seriously revise your launch plan. That's one example. Or let's say you hire this key person for your team. And if this person doesn't meet certain indicators within six months, you're going to seriously reconsider whether you made the right hire. So that's another way to approach this sort of question. So those are the five questions that you can use as I talk them through. It took you know, just about a couple of minutes to talk them through. It should take you about a couple of minutes to actually ask this. And once you learn how to do this, once you learn to ask these questions before every decision, it's going to take you much less time. It's especially helpful if you have everyone in your team ask these questions. It makes the whole decision-making process much more efficient. It makes meetings much more efficient where you structure the agenda by these meetings. So I have all my clients do this, structure the agenda of the meeting by using these questions. It makes the decision-making process much easier and more clear for everyone. Digital communication and collaboration is key for any decision-making process. I think having the team on the same page with these structured questions really makes it crystal clear as to how the process and the decisions are being made. So thanks for laying down those five questions for us. Dr. Kleb, as I'm hearing about you know, the decision-making process, mental fitness seems to be instrumental in how 
one puts their head and wraps it around this entire process. Talk to us about how does That's mental fitness play into this process? aspect of the whole process. So we've talked about uh, the natural intuitive state. Naturally and intuitively, if we had our druthers at what we, we did whatever we want, you know, we'd sit at home and watch TV. That's not it's not an intuitive thing for us to do physical exercise. But we've learned over time from the science on this question that if we don't do physical exercise, our bodies will get very weak and we will very much damage our health. So we do physical exercise and we practice physical fitness. That's very important to do. However, we have not yet learned that it's just as important for us to develop mental fitness as it is to develop physical fitness, become mentally fit. And becoming mentally fit means making the best decisions, training ourselves to go from that natural, primitive, savage state of you know sitting on the couch and watching TV, the gut intuition sort of decision making, to making decisions that are using these counterintuitive techniques, just like it's counterintuitive to go to the gym and actually do some exercise. That's the mental fitness aspect of things, where we retrain ourselves to become more mentally fit, to have our mind be stronger, more capable of making the best decisions, more able to be focused, more able to actually serve our needs in the long run. So that's what mental fitness is about. You have this wealth of knowledge and how has your research helped you become a better person both personally and professionally? Professionally and personally, I've become much more aware of the kind of errors that I tend to make. When I was going to, I, I already gave the example with the 45, with the, my tendency to take the $45 versus the 50% chance of getting $100. Now I'm definitely much more inclined to take the riskier choice that makes much more long-term consequences of, that gives me more long-term benefits. And that's very important. I mean, if you think about the difference of $5 or 10%, if over the course of your whole career, you make 10% more money every year. And of course, the compounded interest is really important here. You get so much more money. And that compounds not only for money, but for health, for social life, for relationships, for everything. 10% of more of everything is a very good thing to have. So that's kind of one example where I've learned to make better choices and avoid doing the safe thing that's actually causes me to lose in the long run. The other, Another example that I've learned to do, both in professional life and personal life, I've learned that I tend to be very optimistic, too optimistic. Now, my optimism serves me in a number of ways. You know, I'm a more cheery person. I'm more personable, more affable, but it causes me to be, to be risk blind. So when I'm making decisions, I tend to be too optimistic about the outcome of these decisions. You know, I think the grass is green on the other side of the hill. I think the glass is half empty. I think everything will be fine. But often I tend to make the wrong decision because I am too optimistic. I estimate the likelihood of positive things occurring to be much more likely than they are. And having learned that, having learned that as part of my PhD and having this self-evaluations, self-understanding, I now take specific steps to address this optimism. I get, for example, I get external feedback from more pessimistic people. A great example is my wife. She's much more pessimistic than me. She thinks that the grass is yellow on the other side of the hill. So I make sure to run my ideas and decisions by her before implementing them. Because otherwise, I've learned that I tend to make serious errors in my optimism. But she can give me that positive feedback or that feedback saying that, hey, this is a bad idea, but this is a good idea. And once we find what's a good idea, she says, okay, this is a good idea. Let's go with it. She's great at improving it. So pessimists are not great at coming up with new ideas because they see a lot of risks, but they're great at taking ideas and then improving those ideas going forward, uh, shaving off all the rough edges, taking that half-baked potato and finishing baking it. So I've learned, for example, to work well with pessimists like my wife, in collaborating effectively. So I'm much more able to collaborate with all sorts of people because I'm able to understand where they're coming from, understand their weaknesses and their strengths, and use them to complement my own. I'm so glad your wife is a great partner to your thoughts, uh, because it's always nice for one person to be a go-getter, be very creative, and for the other person to 
to be a little cautious and see how much of risk you're taking in certain situations. So uh, um, I'm glad the partnership is working well for you. So now that the book is launched, what's going on in your mind and how has the reception for the book been? It's been really great to see people who, and I'll be curious to ask you that uh, too, who just intuitively think that, hey, going with your gut is the right thing to do, to now start to question themselves and say, hey, you know, maybe my gut Maybe there are some cases in the past where I've made some decisions that I went with my gut and they weren't the best decisions. And asking these five questions, for example, would have prevented me from making these decisions. I was just giving a presentation to a group of uh, Vistage members who are middle-level leadership positions in companies of 100 to 1,000 people. And we've talked about a number of examples where they tended to go with their gut. They felt that they could trust their gut. But once they started to think about situations where they made decisions that were too fast and they that were wrong because of fight or flight response, or they made decisions based on liking somebody or disliking somebody, and this like or dislike wasn't actually about this person's competence in the workplace, but about their background, about their characteristics, things that don't really have an impact on their work. So these sorts of thoughts and these sorts of understandings that, hey, I need to be more humble about my decisions. I need to trust myself less, be more humble, be less arrogant, be less confident than I intuitively am, and actually adopt this process, these five questions to avoid decision disasters. That has been very helpful and I've been very cheered to see people adopting them and being able to integrate these and actually cause themselves and others around them less suffering because that's what I'm passionate about, decreasing suffering and increasing well-being for people. And I'm seeing my book do so and that's really exciting. That's something I'm very passionate about. Well-being is the key uh, in today's society and I'm so glad your book is you know, moving the needle in that way. So, Dr. Gleb, are you ready to be in the hot seat for us? Sounds good. So, here's how this is going to work. I'll tell you a word or a sentence, and you tell me the first thing that comes to your mind. And unlike your book, this has to be going with your gut and a very fast and flight response. So, let's see uh, how this works. Leadership. Uh, Decision making. Role model. Bill Gates. A favorite book besides yours. (laughs) Of course. Thinking fast and slow. A value that you strongly believe in. Integrity. What does happiness mean to you? Satisfaction with the way I'm currently living my life. What is your native language and one word to describe yourself in that language? My native language is Russian, optimistic. That brings us to the end of our podcast with Dr. Gleb. Dr. Gleb, it's been a a wonderful experience getting to hear your perspectives on how not to go with your gut and the five uh, questions as part of a decision-making process. You know, for me personally, as somebody who believes in gut instincts and as a woman, you feel your intuition always overrules your mind. I'm excited to read your book to see what perspectives could be useful to retrain my mind. That was Dr. Gleb Sipersky for you guys on Career Startup Podcast. This is your host, Priyanka Komla, signing off until another episode with another interesting guest. Thank you.